then, then that's, you know, it will be as I prime the pump a little bit. Okay? All right. So we'll start with... Um, Weird. All right. We'll start with um, a review of signals and systems. Okay? And I guess the, the place to start... Well, you know, let's, let's, let's relax a little bit and, and think about things um, intuitively for a while. And, and, and one, one, one of the things I'd like to start with is the concept of favorite functions. Okay? And what we saw last time for electrical engineers, one of our favorite functions, or two of our favorite functions, are the sinusoids. Sines and cosines. And we talked about, we, 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 could, we could sketch them in the time domain. And we could instantly sketch them in the frequency domain. And if we... Either, either of those representations in the time domain or the frequency domain, either of those representations we know is a sinusoid, is a cosine. And that's one thing that's very, one thing that's very important right off the bat is I can give you this representation, cosine omega t, and you know that it's a cosine. I can draw a graph like that, and you know it's a cosine. Or I can represent it in frequency space, and you know it's a cosine. I could give you one of those, two of those, or all three of those in any combination, and I've conveyed to you exactly what I mean by that function. Some instruments, like the oscilloscope, will give you the graph of cosine omega t. Sometimes, theory-wise, theory we want to work with the analytic expression cosine omega t. Sometimes, if our frequency is so high and our power is so low, an oscilloscope won't do the job experimentally, and so we'll use, an RF, we'll use a spectrum analyzer, for example, an RF spectrum analyzer, and that'll give us, that'll give us well, at least that half of it. Okay? All right. We briefly talked about the sinusoid last time and the difference between a cosine and a sine was exactly the phase, 90 degrees. And that manifests itself, as we talked about last time, in the negative frequency space. And so from that, small observation, I decided to generalize dramatically and suggest to you that a, a, an interpretation of negative frequency is phase. Okay? So phase becomes a very, very important, say, a very, very important concept. Now, one of the one of the things, one of the ways I want to talk about that. Sorry, I've got this recording light supposed to be constant and it's flashing all over the place. Well, that's why this is a test run. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, so phase, phase is actually an important thing. We usually think in terms of Bode plots. Does anyone remember Bode plots? Briefly, what's a Bode plot? Any of you that I'm pointing in that general direction? I was talking, you didn't talk to the gentleman in the plaid shirt because he was nodding. And then he, then he looked away <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I pointed over there. So, it, it, what, what is, what's the Bode plot? Mm -hmm. It's just a series of, um, you have poles and zeros and um, kind of functions. And, you know, I can't, I don't really know. Well, let's, let's, let's answer the question slowly. 
Okay? That's usually a good way to do things. Um, and I'll get into this, you know, probably along about Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon in more detail. But, but um, if you remember, on a Bodhi plot, it has axes like this. And what are the two axes on a Bodhi plot? Yell it. Mm, not quite. Not yet. Not yet. For, uh, frequency is on this axis. An amplitude of some function. And I'm going to use this notation, even though we don't know what that is yet. Can you see that? H? H? Yeah, it's small. Yeah, H of H bar. And so, and so if that's the amplitude of that H... What, 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 am I, what, what, what would this Bode plot look like? Let's say it's a filter. What kinds of filters are out there? Okay, so let's, let's say it's a low-pass filter. How would it be? Starts up flat and goes down. And it would be fairly, fairly primitive because, generally speaking, you would plot the log and the log, Right? And what the log will do, will it, will, it will iron out all these ripples and will allow us a large amount of information to be conveyed. And so we've called this a low-pass filter, and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that one up because it says that the low frequencies go through fine and the high frequencies get attenuated. <coughs> and so if we go back to our sines and cosines, we can superimpose the Bode plot on top of these sines and cosines, and we can see if that's that particular component survives the filtering operation. Okay? Now, there's a second plot that goes with, with there's a second plot that goes with um, uh, the magnitude. And somebody was talking about, was it, was it real and imaginary that you were bringing up? So, so the Fourier transform of a real function has, in fact, a real and imaginary part interestingly enough. And we're going to talk about that later on, exactly why that is. And that has some interesting ramifications. We won't get to that until way into AM. It's a subtle and advanced topic in amplitude modulation. But we'll look, we will relook at that again. Now, when we go to Bode plots, we don't necessarily plot the real part and the imaginary part. We plot the magnitude. And how is the magnitude related to the real part and the imaginary part? You're going to take the square of the imaginary part, you're going to take the square of the real part, and you're going to square root it. Okay? Uh, So you're taking two pieces of information, the real part and the imaginary part, and bringing bringing it into one quantity. Right? Now, but there's still two pieces of information, and I can't, I haven't expressed independently both those pieces on this one plot. So what, what, else, what else do I do? If I, if I take real part and imaginary part, I get a magnitude. What else do I do with the real part and the imaginary part? Phase. To get the phase part. And if I remember right, I'm, this is the inverse tangent. Oh, dear. Help my memory. Is it the... Thank you. The imaginary part of the real part, the inverse tangent part, and from there you'll see we'll see we'll see a um, some sort of a phase response associated with that. And it's interesting that we'll see phase reversals. We'll see phase reversals right where that transition from high pass to low pass is. So if I make a change on my circuitry to adjust say, well, let's see, for a low-pass filter, how do I determine that, that point? It's a 3 dB point, but what, if I'm building this with um, simple passive electronic, electric components, what are some of the ways that I can build there? Yell it out. A resistor and series and a capacitor to ground. A resistor and a capacitor. We'll do that. And how do the resistance and the capacitance come together to give me that 
that turn. Think sloppy. You don't have to worry about pies or anything like that. The higher the frequency, the more your faster axis are wired and big runs. So you have a resonant or some sort of resonant frequency. None of that's wrong. So I have a resistance and a capacitance. If I multiply those guys together, R and C, what are the units? Fine. We're gonna go we're gonna go through all of this, but maybe not right now. There's something called an R C time constant. And so I can and, and, and one over tau. is one over RC. Now, there's pi's in there, right? There's pi's and two pi's because I'm, I'm, I'm working with a time constant here and I'm working with, with, uh, with radians per second there. But I don't want you to stress out about that right now. That's, that's bookkeeping that we'll get to when we look carefully at that. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things, one, I guess I started this digression and allowed us to introduce, review roughly uh, a lot of interesting concepts that you've had in several different courses. But I, but I did this for a reason. This phase reversal here that, cause, that comes right around the time constant, right around one over the time constant, is the difference between passing and rejecting a frequency component. If I have two sinusoids and they line up in phase, I have constructive interference. On the other hand, after the phase reversal, those two sinusoids are going to add up out of phase and sum to a flat line or no signal. Okay? So, there's, it's interesting for many systems, many of the systems that we're going to look at, there's no new information in these two graphs. In other words, this transition here means exactly the same transition going off over here. Okay? All right. Enough of that. We're going to come back to that. Oh, wait a minute. Um, you said one very... You, when I asked the question about the particular low-pass filter... You had a very specific, um, you didn't answer just a resistor and a capacitor, you answered something else. The resistor in series and the capacitor to ground. I'm going to redraw that just a little bit like this. Okay? Mm -hmm. A little bit like that. It's still resistor in series, I just bent the wire. Mm -hmm. Wires are ductile, I can do that. So this is the resistance and this is the capacitance. And what, um, do I know something about the complex impedance of that capacitor? 1 over J omega C. Okay. So this, you, this is a frequency dependent element. I'm checking her. I don't believe her. So I'm checking her whether or not this really is a low pass filter. So, so at low frequencies like DC, this capacitor looks like a good memory. A low frequency or a DC signal comes down here. It sees no path to ground because that's an open circuit. So all of those roll through the resistor. That's another way of showing the path span there. At very high frequencies, what does that omega, what does that omega mean? the resistance or the impedance is zero. And how do I draw a zero? It's a short wire. I still have that resistor there. But now I have a high frequency signal. And the high frequency signal sees a short to ground. And it never makes it to the resistor where your voltage probe is on. 
So that energy for the high frequency gets sucked to ground and never, never enters your signal. And that's another way of saying that, well, I guess over here, that's another way of saying that that frequency was rejected. Okay? So you're right. You're absolutely right. That, 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 um, I, I never remember it, so I have to rederive it that way. Okay? So there's just a simple example of a low pass filter. Okay. I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about filters um, in lectures to come. So, favorite. Favorite functions, working with sines and cosines, okay? They comprise Fourier series, so we can, we, can we can express any other function in terms of that. You, you, can, you, you can work with sines and cosines in your sleep, and you should be able to. For those reasons, I, I refer to them as some of our very favorite functions in, in, um, in signals and systems and in electrical engineering in, at large. Another favorite function is just a pulse. Instead of an analog waveform, we might consider a digital waveform. Just a, just a little square pulse. And I'll label the width of that pulse TP. Draw this in the time domain. Without stressing too much about the derivation, which I will do, I promise, but without stressing too much about the derivation, what do we remember about what that looks like in the frequency domain? It's a sync function, good. And what is that sync function? What is a sync function? Yell it. What is it? Is it a normalized sine squared? Not quite. What is? What did you say? <coughs> that sounds like a tangent to me. Is it sine of x over x. Yeah. Sine of x over x, or sine of omega over omega, I guess I should say. And there's some other normalizing factors in there because if I change the width of t, I also change the width of of the sinc function. So if I plotted the sinc function, I'd have wiggles on it. Right? The sign, of, the sign part of it would give me wiggles. Yeah? Sorry. If it was... Uh, sorry. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Keep saying that, though. Because I really want you to see. I'm not trying to hide it. I'm not this Vegas gambler that's, like, throwing down, you know, car, an ace of spades here or there and trying to put one over on you. So the sign part of this gives me wiggles. And the one over omega part of it gives me a decay. And so the sync function looks something like this. And trust me, in lectures to come, I will very much go through the details of the, of the, of the relationships on that. But one of the things to point out... Oh, you'll have to do some thinking about why that's one and not zero over zero. Okay. But the, other, but the thing I wanted to think about is if I vary this TP, if I make this TP much shorter, what do I do with the, with the sync function? If I, make, if I make TP very narrow, a shorter pulse, what happens to the frequency content? It goes up. So the sync function gets, gets fatter. The sync function gets fatter as TP goes smaller. And as TP goes bigger, the sync function gets tighter. It has lower frequency content. The fatter, the longer the pulse is, the slower the frequency content, and the less you need the high frequency behavior. Okay? That, that kind of relationship, that, that, what is it? Time is one over frequency. Hertz and seconds. That's all it is. Just look at the units. So a short duration in time is a very long frequency duration. 
a short, a, a long, a long duration in in, in, in in time is a short duration in frequency. Okay. Now, so these two are Fourier transform pairs. Okay. If I make this pulse very, 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 very short, we said that this guy gets very, 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 very long. And can anyone tell me what Fourier transform pair I'm thinking about on that figure? Good. Delta function of T, a short, sharp spike in the time domain. And really, if this is a delta function, what shape should this have? It should be a straight line. A flat, straight line that includes all frequencies. So we know a delta function is, is um, a very special function. It doesn't really exist in real life. It, and because if it did, it would have all frequencies. <coughs> it would have megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, and so on, all the way out. Now, delta functions can be purchased depending on how fast a delta function you need. You'll spend different amount, different amounts of money. If you're working with a time constant on the order of days, you probably don't care about a delta function that's much longer than no, that's shorter than a second, and you can build that with a mechanical contrivance. kick, for example. If you're, if you're working with electronics and you're only worried about a megahertz, well, you could probably get away with a thousandth of that period or a nanosecond for a delta function. And that's not, again, that's very cheap to make. Most computers these days or more, a lot of circuits these days, they work in the gigahertz range and higher. So you might start to need picoseconds worth of delta functions. Hundreds of picoseconds, ten, you know, 10 picoseconds. And to do that, then you, then you need frequency content. If a picosecond is, one over, is 10 to the minus 12, you'll start to need terahertz of bandwidth. The shortest delta functions are under a femtosecond. They're measured in hundreds of, hundreds of attoseconds. And they have frequency content that goes from DC way past daylight. So they include the entire range of the electromagnetic spectrum beyond what your eye can see, well into the ultraviolet. And since things don't really propagate in air beyond that, you need a vacuum. Things ionize once you get up to about 100 nanometers you're not probably going to get much faster than that, practically. Okay? So, Delta, people spend a lot of money developing and, 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 and selling and using very, very fast Delta functions. And I'll remind you, you've seen this in Signals and Systems, and I'll remind you again over the lectures to come in this review lectures, why we care a lot about, about those Delta functions. Okay? But as we see now, as we see now, it's just a, a limit of our square pulse. Okay? Yes, sir? I was wondering what you meant by like selling delta functions. So is it like a special wave generator? It's called a laser. It's called a laser. It's called a mode lock laser. And uh, um, the, you can buy a, a, a let's say, a, a femtosecond, a, few fe a 10 femtoseconds, 20 femtosecond laser. You can buy that for $20,000 cheap. And it fits in a, in a little, like a pizza box container. So, and you use it exactly to interrogate systems, exactly like we've taught you in signals and systems. You have, you have a variety of different systems, semiconductors, circuitry, detectors, a variety of those things, and you want to characterize them. 
And so you use this, this, this delta function machine called a laser, a particular kind of laser, to get them to, to, under, to interrogate, measure, characterize, calibrate, understand, and so on. Exactly like we taught you in signals and systems, and exactly like we'll get to in a couple of, in, in, in a few hours of lecture. Wanted to start off at a real intuitive sense, getting you thinking about what we're, you know, getting those memory gears, priming the pump of your signals and systems knowledge that you have, but I just want to get it back out there. One of the things that, um, oh, let's see. Um, let's take the other limit while we're here. So I've got TP and I've got a distance there, 1 over TP. Now, supposing instead of making this pulse short, I make it infinitely long. What does that look like in the frequency domain? A delta function? Is that what you said? I think you said that, right? You said that? Where do I put that delta function? Well, I, I'm confused here, right? Hang on a second. I had another piece of paper back here, and, I, and now, now you got me really confused on this. Um, I thought we had delta functions when we had sines and cosines. I thought, I thought when I thought, and we all agreed that I thought when I had a cosine of omega t, I had delta functions, and when I had a sine of omega t, I had delta functions in the frequency domain. And now you're telling me that I have a delta function in the frequency domain when I, have a, when I don't have a sine and a cosine. I have a flat line. Do you want to rethink your answer? Well, if you essentially have a DC in time, and you're going to have uh, zero frequency. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Um, if I set this cosine omega t, if I set that zero frequency, I start pulling in. I start pulling in my delta functions, exactly the way you phrased it. And so this is a delta function at omega equals zero. Okay? Did you have a question? Okay. Brilliant. And again, this is, this is, the, this is in order for, the, for us to be thinking about this. One of the test questions I asked a few years back, I thought it was a really good question. Everyone know the symbol, that symbol? What is it? It's a battery? <coughs> nine volt battery. What's the Fourier transform of the nine volt battery? Where? Exactly right. Okay. Does everyone see that? The output of the nine volt battery is an infinitely long pulse at nine volts. And so as long as it's charged, which will work, if it's in a smoked alarm, it'll work for a year until you have a guest sober, and then it'll start beeping. <laughs> and, and, and so then for that time, it'll have, it'll have that, that, that one spike. But again, think about the intuition of that. You all know this Fourier transform pair, but it requires a little bit more understanding to go from there to there. And yet that's exactly the mark of engineering is to recognize this in its abstraction as a, as a long pulse or, an, or a DC waveform with zero frequency that has a delta function at, at zero. One of the things that I want to point out to you, so I'm creating a Fourier transform table, or we're creating a Fourier transform table, right? You know, here, these are all Fourier transform pairs. They're messy. They're, they're lacking in two pies, factors of two, and all this other stuff. They're, that all can be cleaned up, right? But this is a very different kind of a Fourier transform table than, than what you're used to doing. Because in your signals and systems book, and in our Lati book, I think it's, a, I think it's table 3.1 or 3.2, there's a table of Fourier transform pairs. And those are the analytic representations of... of, of well, the square pulse, 
I think Flati uses this for that notation. And the sync function. So Lati or most Fourier transform books give you this and this as Fourier transform pairs. But it's so much better if we're actually going to use it to think about this and this, these pictures as Fourier transform pairs. And so one of the things that one of the things that, that, that I would encourage you guys to do is to build yourself a, a pictorial table a pictorial table of Fourier transforms. You can do it in your head. You can do it sketching the way I've done it. If you're really, if you're really a, a, a careful student, you, you'll, you'll program, you'll, you'll draw a graph of this in Excel or MATLAB and a graph of this in Excel and MATLAB and have those figures. If you run across a brand new function and you don't have this analytic stuff, well, you can use... Is there a numerical technique that allows you to calculate or approximate the Fourier transform? What was it? it, it there's a, there's a, there is one in Mathematica. There's one in Excel. There's one in MATLAB. Yell it. The FFT. Absolutely. And so, and, and, and if you go to my, just another reminder, if you go to my webpage, not yet my e-learning, but my webpage, you'll have all the MATLAB code from chapters 2, 3, now 4, 5, 6, 4, 5, 7, at least through 7. All the MATLAB code that's in LATI is, is on those is in either MATLAB file, .m files or text files. Either way, you can cut and paste them right into MATLAB and have them. And in there, they have, they have plotting packages and they have the FFT stuff in there. So dirt simple, dirt simple to start to start doing this not only in just by plotting what's those those analytic forms in table 3.1, 3.2, but also if you run across a new a new one, you can you can go you can use that code and do it numerically. Okay, and you don't even right now you don't even have to think about what it means. Just know that you're taking the same information in the time domain and representing in, in the frequency domain. Okay. Help your intuition a lot, I think. What other favorite functions do we have? Okay, a ramp. How do I work with ramps? Well, what if you have an oscillating series? Okay, so so you're to, to, to just shift a little bit what you said. Um, what I what I heard was you would take this ramp and you would express it in terms of a Fourier series, yes. and that would give you a good frequency representation. And I do not disagree with that at all. But the way I like to th- I like to simplify things, and the ramp is actually an interesting one because supposing I have a delta function. And I integrate that delta function. If I'm on this side of the delta function, my integral is? If I'm on this side of my delta function, my integral is? The integral. One. Minus infinity to t. And so what I construct is a step function. So delta functions are also very cool because they beget step functions. Now, the next step up is the integral of u of t, dt. What happens there? That's my ramp. And if I do that again, if I take, if I take the integral of r of t, I get quadratics, I get cubic, and then do it again, I get cubics. So all my, all my polynomials, all my polynomials stem from the delta function. Okay? So you don't have to go around memorizing the ramps, the quadratics, the cubics, because all those guys are, are, are fall out of 
the delta function transforms plus the plus the manipulations for the integration in in the table 3.2. Okay. Again, my memory is horrible. And so the more I can do not to remember, the better off, the happier I am. Okay? All right. Um, we talked about one... Um, let's see. Well, I'm going I'm to show you one of my favorite. And this is a call out to another prerequisite of this class. One that we always forget about because of the nightmares that we had. Did I write that clear enough? Ugh. My penmanship is going to heck, too, on this. Okay? So that's a, that's a nice, smooth pulse. And it's the Gaussian. There's, again, there's factors up in there and, and, and a nice normalized factors if I, wanna, if I want the area under the curve to equal one. But basically, in the time domain, the width of that is that pulse width. Some measure. Some measure of the width of that is pulse width. We'll have to think about that as we go down the path. Does anyone remember by chance, what that Fourier transforms into? So if this is fat, then this Gaussian is going to be skinny. And if this Gaussian is fat, is skinny, then that is going to be fat. The Gaussian in the time domain, in the frequency domain, is going to be fat. So that's really remarkable that a Gaussian Fourier transforms into a Gaussian. Okay. And Gaussians are very nice from a variety of situations. All stochastic processes, all random processes, are going to, you know, the many, many, many of them are going to, are going to anneal to a, a Gaussian. And so for whenever, whenever I have a successive filtering process going on, a Markovian process going on or something on that, Gauss, a Gaussian will pop up. And the nice thing is once you have a Gaussian, then the Fourier transform is just itself. Let me give you a couple of real-life examples of what we've seen so far. The square pulse... Go into the sink function. The square pulse going to the sink function. There's a there's a, a an electromagnetics, or there's a water wave analogy to this. If I've got waves, that are propagating towards a an aperture. And one way to think about this is you're at the beach and there's a little harbor inside this beach and the harbor is protected by a jetty or a barrier and the waves are just coming in nice, flat against that, against that little opening. What's going to happen is the waves are going to diffract out from there and on the beach, far away, as long as you're far away, you'll see a sync pattern from, that, from those waves. That'll happen for any wave-like phenomenon that propagates a long distance away from a, a, an opening like that. So you might have seen the single slit experiment in physics. You might have read about the single slit experiment in physics for a, for a light wave coming onto this aperture. In the far field, you diffract out into, into, a, into, a, into a sync function. And so... The, the, the thought of that is that Fourier transforms are not mathematical, purely mathematical contrivances. They exist in real life. They exist in nature. So the propagation of waves, for example, in optics or electromagnetics and so on, in some limits, you out pops a Gaussian. I'm sorry, out pops a Fourier transform pair. Okay? 
If I have two slits, that's the same thing as two pulses, and so on and so forth. Gaussians also figure heavily in optics and electromagnetics. If I have, does anyone have a laser pointer either here or at home? If you've all seen a laser pointer, you know that it's a nice line that comes out of your laser that looks like that. Creates a nice little spot on the blackboard or the, or the screen or your, in front of your cat. <laughs> it turns out, for many, many reasons, that the shape of that spot is a Gaussian. And so if I put any kind of optical elements in there, the propagation through all of those, because of the Fourier transform property, will always be Gaussians. If I put a lens in there, a focusing lens, the spot will get skinnier as it focuses down. If I put a defocusing lens in there, the spot will get fatter. But it's still a Gaussian. So like these are <coughs> In that case, the lenses are taking the Fourier transform of the signal, but because the Fourier tra transform is a Gaussian, we don't recognize that. Or conversely, perhaps we use the Gaussian because it has that property. Or conversely, because Gaussians are so magical that they pop up in the generation of the light inside of that, inside that laser. Inside that laser. Okay, and all of those, all, all, all those reasons are true. All of those reasons are true. Yes, sir. That means that if I, if I, that means that if I take a detector, oh, okay, if I put a camera there, if I put a camera there, like a cell phone camera there, and I take a picture of it, well, first of all, if I do that, I'll blind the camera. But if I put a, if I put a lot of, of of tissue paper in front of it, or or sunglasses, stack up a bunch of sunglasses through there, so just a little bit of it goes through, then what the distribution will look like will be a Gaussian, a Gaussian spot. Let me see if I can draw it. Something looks like that. So if I'm looking down on it, it'll it'll be this blob, and I'll fit it to a Gaussian, and it'll fit very well to a Gaussian. The intensity of the light will be hottest in the center and roll off to zero as it gets out. Exactly like what you would expect if, you, if you're thinking about this beam of light. If you're in the middle of the beam of light, you'll be blinded. But if I step, to the, step a, a millimeter to the side, I'll be saved. Okay? Gaussians are nice to work with, as are most of these other functions, because the fitting parameters are so few cosine has an omega. A pulse width has a TP. A Gaussian has a TP. They're all, they're, they're, there's not a lot of information that they really contain, and so, they, and so they're, very, they're very useful for us. They're very simple and very useful for us. One more special function. Um, no, I'm not special. One more favorite function. This goes back to our low-pass filter. If I solve the low-pass filter or that circuit problem, and I'll do this for you. If I solve this, this low-pass filter problem, I'll sketch it here and I'll be more careful next time or in, in, a, in a few lectures. I can describe this in terms of a differential equation, right? Something like D2V, or oh, sorry, DV dt is equal to uh, plus RC, I'm sorry, 1 over RC, uh, V is equal to whatever the driving term is. And the solution to that differential equation is that e to the minus t over RC. What's the Fourier transform of that of that of that um, e to the minus t over RC? What'd you say? What does it look like? 
Wouldn't it look similar to the uh, Gaussian? Because one side. Similar to the Gaussian? It's also similar to, let's see, we had it up here. This is kind of fun sorting through all these things. Oh, where do we have that up there? That was very early on. Ah, here we go. We had it sort of up here in the log scale. The Fourier transform of that was the, was the, was the essence of the Bode plot. But let's be more mathematical than that. Oh, to do this, we have to imagine that it's symmetric. An exponential rise and then an exponential fall. We only really care about what's on the right-hand side. Maybe. If things start at zero and don't go before. And this, in which case we'll have a lump. <coughs> in the frequency domain. If TP is short, if RC is small here, then this lump will be very wide. So if I have a short decay, looking more and more like a delta, a delta function, then this frequency content would be very high. On the other hand, if this RC constant is very slow and sloppy, so that it averages a lot of frequencies, then this guy is going to be confined closer to, the, to, to zero. Now, what do you do with that point here? Pardon? You, you have that spike um, where the Gaussian is a nice curve. So what's the shape of this function is what you're saying? Yes. The shape of the function is not a Gaussian. The shape of the function is called, I don't know if you've seen this word before, a Lorentzian. What's the in Gaussian? And the, the formula for this is 1 over 1 plus omega tau squared, where that tau is the RC time constant. So this is the formula for a Lorentzian. And I bring this up as last. I bring this last because it's very interesting. We're, 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 you've used this function a million times. And you've gone through back and forth a million times. But you, you even re, I'm impressed. You even remembered that a Gaussian was a Fourier transform of a Gaussian. That's a, that's a, that's a form. That's a function you have much much less familiarity with. And it's and, and, and one of the reasons why I, I bring this up here and now is that you have the same familiarity of this, but you just haven't thought about it, and you haven't given a name to it. I'm not big on names, but in this case, you know. If you, it might be good to, it might, it might be helpful to remember Lorentzian. Okay. So again, these are, that's probably ninety-five percent of the functions that we're going to deal with in this class. That little pictorial back and forth between time domain and frequency domain, for those, for those particular um, uh, Fourier transform pairs. Much, much more useful to visualize them as graphs. But if you want to do them rigorously, then by all means, pull out the, the table 3.1 and, and work through all the factors of two pi's and so on that are in there, the two ln 2's and things of that nature. Okay? But when we're, when we're trying to piece together the operation of a, of a complicated communication system, then that's the, the intuition that we just went through is going to be huge in this class the action of a low-pass filter versus a high-pass filter, the placement of the R and the C. We're going to go, I'll go again and again and again through what, what filtering means to me and what filtering could, should mean to you in the context of this course. That's, that's something that, she'll, that I'll come back to again and again as, as we go on in lectures. And I'm delighted, I'm delighted that you're remembering at least that much of it. And then, because then I can build from there to push your, push your, push your, um, your thinking. All right.
a little bit of an unconventional start to this, but, but I find it very useful right off the bat to get you, to stir you up a little bit and to get you thinking about the things you already know. And, re- and trust me, the answers to the questions were brilliant and perfect and good, but they're now out on the table, and that's more important. Instead of being like little pieces that were filed away, they're now in front of us, and we can now use them and use them to move on. Okay? So I, I, I like to start the course with that kind of, you know, free, free form thinking. All right. Let me go. Let me be a little more grounded. And I'll start the review in a little bit more of a conventional manner. And the the title of the course that you took was called Signals and Systems. Signals and Systems. And it's interesting. I don't know if you've thought about this. But, the, but sometimes you think of a signal as a system and sometimes you think of a system as a signal. So you go back and forth on those. Okay, sometimes you think of a signal as a system and sometimes you think of a system as a signal. A signal that generates, a system that generates a signal can be characterized by that signal. Okay? But regardless, um, we'll talk about signals. And what I mean by a signal, or what we mean by a signal in, in communications, is information over time. It's information over time. Okay. One of the signals that we will talk about at great length is the message signal M of T. Okay? And clearly what I mean by the message signal is the information that we're going to put on our, on our, on our, on our communication system. In this class, the communication system is all around speech. I'll speak. The sound waves will propagate out. They'll hit your ears. You'll receive that. Hopefully quite a lot you'll speak. You'll raise your hand, you'll answer questions, you'll ask questions, in which case the information is flowing from, from, um, from you to me. Okay? It's interesting, it's an interesting property of the message signal, it's an interesting property of the information is that it's really not information, it's really not useful unless you have no idea what I'm about to say. Blue, next. Red. Something has to be surprising, has to be random. There's a random nature to the message signal. Otherwise, there's no information being transmitted in that context. So what we'll find in the last part of the course is that the difference between noise and the message signal is nothing. <laughs> the dis- the di- they're both random. They're both, they both have the same stochastics in terms of that. If you, if, I, if you know what I'm going to transmit next, I'm not transmitting anything useful. And for that reason, the message signal M of T has a lot of random nature to it. However, you not predict what you're saying and uh, neutralize it and kind of filter out anything there are some things there are some things that there are some, approx- some assumptions you can make about M of T and sometimes that, al- sometimes that allows you to, to filter out or get rid of some of the noise so in those situations we, um, it's all random but we can filter out some random give you an example um, if you use your cell phone for, for talking for speaking, generally speak, generally that um, the information content is going to be found between a few hertz and a few kilohertz. And so, if you're if you're designing a channel for voice, a channel for a telephone channel, you can if your if your noise is a hundred kilohertz, you can reject anything greater than two kilohertz. Okay. On the other hand, if you want to use your phone for music, 
songs work out to 20, 30 kilohertz. And so if you want to make the assumption that you're going to be using your cell phone for voice versus music, those are two very, very different filters. Very, very different assumptions that you make. Okay? But there's noise at one kilohertz. There's noise at 500 hertz. And that will be indistinguishable from the message as far as your electronics and your channel will go. Because you don't know if, if, the, if, the, if, um, in within for, if my inflection goes up versus a noise spike hits you, you won't know that a priori. Okay? Generally speaking, though, we talk about voltages as a function of time or currents as a function of time. And there's a relationship between current and energy or power, voltage or energy and power. And that's a really confusing relationship. I mean, it's obvious that the math is simple, but it, it, gets, it, gets, it, it can drive us crazy. So we'll talk about the energy of a signal. <coughs> which will be the square of the amplitude of the signal. Okay. And you'll notice that the limits of the integration are from minus infinity to infinity over all time. Okay. And you'll notice that you'll take your voltage, you'll take your current, you'll square it. There's going to be some factors in front of it to get your, if you, to get your units into joules if you want. And there you have it. If you have a Gaussian pulse, this just says square the Gaussian pulse and take the area under the curve. If I have a square pulse, square it and take the area under the curve. If I've got a sine wave, things fall apart. Because if I have a sine wave and I square it, that rectifies the signal and I start adding from minus infinity to infinity, I get, I get an infinite amount of energy area under the curve because the sine wave started at minus infinity. It goes to positive infinity. When I square it, everything becomes positive and that's a whole lot of energy. And so that becomes very, 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 very cumbersome to work with. So energy signals, again, I'll just be candid, I think of them as pulses, finite pulses. Whatever the shape of that pulse is, or st a stream of pulses, there's your, there, that's what we refer to as an energy signal. As lo formally, as long as that integral is, is finite. If not, then we have to make a small modification. We ask for what the power is of that signal. We still want to square it. We still care about what happens over all time. But we've got to do something. We've got to do something to make that finite. And so what we do... Oh, okay. Energy is measured what units? And power is measured what units? What's the relationship between joules and watts? Time. What? Joule per second. A joule per second is a watt. So what I have here, if this is joules, what I have here is joules. And I've got to change that into time. If I do a 1 over t, that 1 over t envelope damps out what happens at positive infinity to minus infinity hopefully strong enough to make this into a, into, a, into a decent measurable quantity. If not, then I have to stretch my head and start thinking about t squared, whatever t cubed, and so on. But let's not go there. The purpose of that 1 over t is to attenuate what happens at minus infinity and positive infinity with time so that I can, I can, I can, I can turn this around. I can also look at this as a certain amount of energy averaged over time. 
So over a period of time, what is the energy in that signal? And then a new block of time comes and I'm delivered a new energy, a new bundle of energy. Okay? I turn on the light in a, in a, in a house for a day. <coughs> the watts flow through. I add up the total amount of energy off of that bulb on a Monday. And I divide by the 24 hours in that Monday and that's the number of... That's the, that's the kilowatt hours. Okay. Weird unit, but familiar, unfortunately. There's a few more little things that we do here. We make our, 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 peri- our, our limits of integration finite, and then we make them infinite again through a limit. Okay? And that's the formal definition for power signals or for calculating the power of a signal. And here's, here's one of the interesting things that I want to point out about that, which is you're, you're used to working with sines and cosines, and so you're used to thinking about that T as a period of a sine and a cosine. And while it can be, that's not the, that's not the way we've defined that, that power integral. That power integral is just a window, capital T, that I get bigger, let, big, get, let get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So, so, do you remember that the message signal was random? A random bit set of ones and zeros, a random interplay of a bunch of sines and cosines, digital versus analog. So those are gonna those are gonna be power signals if they if I drone on and on and on forever. They won't have a period because they're aperiodic. They're random. I never know when the next one or zero is gonna hit. And so that T but this this definition will still will still survive because that capital T is there. We're saying if you have a signal, not necessarily a communication signal, but just a signal, and you want to take the average of over a period of time, not a period. Yes. Yes. What would you apply to Well, this could be M of T. What's the power of M of T? But now M of T is a completely random continuous time variable. I square it, and I, and I pick my T not on the basis of any Fourier component, but just on the, on the, on, or look at it over a millisecond, look at that over a uh, you know, a second, look it out over a thousand seconds, and so on. And, you know, when you would want to know the power of a signal. What's the average power that hits the, that it hits the antenna? Well, what's the average power that hits the receiver in your car radio? Because if it's not powerful enough, it's not, I'm not going to be able to listen to music. Okay, so I'm going to be out of range. Yeah. Power budgets are, are very, very nice in, um, in, commu- in thinking about a communication link. I can detect a power, I can detect a signal above a certain threshold power. If I'm below that power, I don't, I can't, I can't do that. So that's, that's it. But let me, uh, yes, sir. I was just wondering about what is that energy? Like, what is the energy? You can't read my writing? That's, oh, that's, a, that's a weird script E. For energy, I do that because um, I teach EMAG, and and the capital E, the nice block readable capital E, is the electric field, and so I don't want it. I don't. So this is just this is just some weird script E. Sorry, it's the energy, E for energy, P for power. It's 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 one of those weird fonts that you'll never use in your. Let's do a quick example. And this is an example that we will do a million times. And this is periodic. This one is periodic. Okay? But we're not going to use the periodicity of this.
I'm sorry, t over 2 minus t over 2. Cosine squared of omega t, dt. Um, now, when you see the cosine squared of omega t, what's the first thing you want to do to it? <coughs> Trig identities. Okay, always, you know, that's, that's sort of, that, that'll make our life a lot easier if you just continue to think in terms of, I'm working with trigonometric functions, trig identities will help us out. And the particular trig identity, as you guys have pointed out, is, what is it, one half plus one half cosine of twice omega t, dt. It's an interesting transformation, by the way. Um, this, uh, the cosine omega t has units there and there, has delta functions there and there. I square it, I square it, and I have something that looks like that. So the, the, the delta function that was here is no longer here. And now there's energy floating here and here that wasn't there anymore. Okay. As a small digression, is squaring a function, is that a linear operation or a nonlinear operation? Nonlinear operation. In signals and systems, did you ever worry about nonlinear operations? Everything was linear time invariant, right? right. Sorry, this class has as many nonlinear effects as it has linear effects. And that's fun and exciting and, 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 and interesting. So don't think that, it, get away from the signals and systems dogma, not everything is going to be linear time invariant. And also as an aside, or an observation, the simplest way, we'll think about this again, but the simplest way to think about, um, the simplest way to identify a, say, a, a system as nonlinear is the presence of new frequency components that didn't exist before. I'll go over this again, but I'll tell you now so you can think about it a little bit. The only thing a linear time invariant system can do to a sinusoid is change its amplitude and change its phase. A nonlinear system can also change the frequency content, but a linear system cannot. So you cannot, a linear system cannot create new frequency content. It can only work with the frequency content that's, in the, that, that, that's introduced to it. So right off the bat, the presence of these new frequencies tells us that this is a nonlinear transformation, and certainly we know quadratics with their curved response are nonlinear. Okay? If I sketch these guys, if I if I if I sketch these, this is the here's the DC term. Okay? And that's and, and, and that that's a very easy that's a very easy integral to do. trying to get my units right here. So this is the first term. This is the DC term. And when, I, when the dust clears here, it's independent of T. And that's just equal to a half. If you want, you can leave a couple of lines in your notebook and show that t over 2 plus t over 2 is t divided by 1 half, divided by t, and you get to a 1 half. You might want to leave that space and later tonight fill that in just to be a nice review reminder. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you for telling me that. Okay? And then, and then this guy here, this guy here, I'm going to, uh, the way I look at that, is this cosine, there's two ways of looking at that. One is 
Um, you can certainly do out the integration. It's a very simple integration to do. Cosine becomes a sine. The, the fact that 1 over 2 omega comes out because you're integrating in, front, in, in, in time space. And then you said then you have definite limits of integration. And you, can, and, you can, and you can work all that through. And what answer will you get? Guess if you don't. The way I look at this, remember we're going to get T going to the infinity, capital T going to infinity. So if I just sketch that, That's an unrectified sine wave. <coughs> and for every positive cycle, I have negative cycles. For every positive, I have a negative. For every positive, I have a negative. And so the positives will cancel out with the negatives. And the answer will be zero. Okay? And what I, what I, what I will ask you to do is to leave your three or four lines underneath that and do out that calculation, do out that do out that uh, integral and show that that's equal to zero. But my, intuit, my, my, my way of thinking about it, I've done that a million times, so my way of thinking about it is, yeah, that's a sinusoid, it goes above the axis and below the axis, positives cancel with negatives, and we're done. That thinking, by the way, also works really well if I have random signals that are bipolar, spending half the time above the axis and half the time below the axis, they'll also have a zero power. Okay? So as long as T is large, that will go to, to zero, and I'm left with one half, just as what's going, just what's, uh, what's going there. When I look at the energy... And when I look at the power, in both cases, I'm averaging. And this in particular is an average, right? I'm adding up the quantity and I'm dividing by the number of quantities that I take. And for the cosine, those high frequencies go away by the averaging. And I'm left only with the lower, the, the, the DC term. Another way to think about a low-pass filter is that it averages. Another way to think about a low-pass filter is that it averages. It sums up and divides out and takes the lowest common denominator. So that resistor and capacitor circuit will just... A, a, a signal will come in, the capacitor will hold that charge on the high and dump it across the resistor, slowly and surely, and average out all the ripples. It will average out all the high-frequency ripples. And that's the same thing as rejecting the high frequencies and passing only the lower frequencies. So, we think, so, so one, another, another way of thinking about a low-pass filter is, is, is averaging, which means if we're building a complicated system and I want to get rid of one of these terms... I can think about it as a filter or I can think about it as an averager. Okay. And again, I'll go back and, and reinforce that many times over as we go along. All right, this is a good place to stop. We're going to go into, we're going to talk a little bit more about signals um, on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock and then again at 10.30. And again at 1, and again at, 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 uh, at, 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 at 2.30. I invite you to come to any and all of these lectures on Saturday and Sunday. I'm buying lunch. I'm buying, I'm buying pizza. And so come, if, even, if you can't make, even if you can't make the lectures, come for lunch. Spend a little bit more time learning, me, you know, learning about me and, and talking to me and talking to your friends. Okay? And I will see you Saturday. And if I don't see you Saturday, then I won't see you probably for another month. And so we will keep in touch by e-learning.
Yeah, I'm really sorry, but I'm, I'm not expecting to see you until early February, either the 7th, for example, or, the, or even the week after that. I'll be, I'll be under the knife and recovering.